Hi everybody, Nathan Howe. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Emerging Technologies here at Zscaler. And we've already spent some time going through the two earlier buckets of an effective zero trust architecture, where we've covered the six main elements, that being the who, the content, context, and what of the, of the verify phase. And then in the control phase, making sure we are understanding the risk, the compromise, or the, th the compromise prevention, and data loss prevention in, uh, in, the, in the, the control phase. In the final phase, we're going to talk about what this all means in terms of policy, because right now we haven't done anything. We've understood the verification, we've got controls, but we've not enabled connectivity. We've not in enabled policy. So to do that, we kind of need to think about that everything we've done here has a reason to get to this point. And by the way, if at any point any of these things fail, for example, a who uh, is the wrong, the wrong user authenticates, well, none of this matters because they can't get access to this stage. It's a, that's why we've built it in a progressive model so that each level could fail if there's something that doesn't match that. Now, at policy, we need to talk about what that policy really is and what the connection is after that. So let's start with policy by putting it in here. Now, policy really comes down to the idea of how do we get these initiators to their destination applications with the right controls in place that we've figured out and based upon that initiator, the control phase, and now we're going to enforce it. But policy for us is not as simple as a yes or no. It is much, much more than that. In our world, we see po um, policy being conditional. So conditional policy mean, is, is a big thing for us in the terms of we want to ensure that it's not just simply an allow or block because that is very binary and very simple. It's not what we should be doing when it comes to the complexity of what these initiators are trying to do to get access applications and nor is it something that is static. The decision here needs to be made on a per session per access request, not a static path. And that's a huge part to why it's conditional because if you think about your initiator, say you're at home on your company laptop and you want to access an application in uh, YouTube, so something in a PaaS service, your conditional policy would say, because you're at home, you're allowed to get access to it, we're going to say yes. But if you're in the office, maybe there's a block in the office, I don't know, maybe that's something you can do. That condition changes based upon the location of the initiator and the condition changes that you're not going to allow access to YouTube. It's a silly example, but it should be one that very, very much paints the picture of the control that is here based upon these conditions matching the policy defined by you, the business. So that po policy needs to contain various sets of options. Now, these options are not necessarily simply as, as I said before, uh, allow or block, but we need to think of them as in terms of allow and why and block and why, but also allow and what and not just block and what. So let me explain. So policy, if I'm going to allow, can end up being in a number of subdivisions. And allow is going to be things like, well, do I warn the user? So say that your end user has requested a website or a service that you don't know about. If you remember in the what phase here, uh, the element, we don't actually, we, uh, we look to find out what the application is, where it is. Now, if we don't know what it is, well, maybe we should warn the user and say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. User, that, that application you requested, we don't know about that. Are you sure you want to continue? So if the user clicks yes, then the responsibility is with them. You can put it into a little message to, so they understand that. So it's a simple example. Well, another one could be quarantine. Now, I know we're all a bit used to quarantine nowadays, um, but quarantine in terms of technology in this regards is sure, ensuring that when that request comes through, we're only going to put that person into the right access path if they're allowed access, sure. We're also going to do it within a context that only allows them to see something and maybe not interact with the site. So the idea of an isolated environment. Isolation is a sub-variant of this, so you can say that we don't want uh, so late. We don't want to allow the end user to get access to the destination site up here, but we want to let them see a version of it. That means they can view it, maybe interact with it, but not upload and download files, thus allowing you, the enterprise, to put controls around that site. Now that could be for internet services, private services, really doesn't matter. It's really a matter of you having that control. Now there's many other things we can do with the policy controls. But the whole idea of this example was to show you that we have many conditional implementations of the allow. Now, conversely, we also have block. And I'll move this down a little bit to show you. Now block, you can think of it as like a straight block, like a good old fashioned network termination. I don't want to allow that access. Fine, but we can do that. 
but that's too easy. We should also think about block in terms of, well, do I want to block in quarantine? Not just allow in quarantine. Maybe I want to send that traffic to malicious, uh, that malicious traffic that's been requested by a perhaps infected user into an environment that is not allowed to have access, but we're going to quarantine it. Or another fun one is to send it off to the deception engine. And that's actually a great way to play with malicious actors. So say that one of the user, uh, the um, initiators here at the bottom is infected for whatever reason. And yes, they've managed to get through these stages, but we've noticed that perhaps it's actually a compromised account or something that's causing it to be a compromise. Rather than allow it, or if we block it, if we block it, then the attacker will know they've been detected. So let's send them on to a honeypot kind of environment to let them then play and give your security team a lot of signals and insight as to how they can go and protect against those solutions, or those sort of uh, attackers. That gives incredible high fidelity insights, not only to the security operations team, but also then stops the attackers from getting access to the production environment. So you can send them off on their deceived way and let them play, and you get some really cool insights. So this in itself, this policy control, as I mentioned at the beginning, is not a simple allow block. It's much more, and we can dive into more in a much larger, longer video about this and the ins and outs of that. But the goal of this policy, and not only is to say, I need to now, now enable access, but is also to determine how to get access. So in this diagram on the left-hand side here, I'm actually gonna switch colors just to emphasize it. You will see some arrows pointing from the policy engine. Now, if it's going from services that are here, internet-based services, public services that are out of your control, this is the SaaS, PaaS sort of internet-based services you'll find. What will happen is that control or policy, if enabled, will allow it to get access here. This is a direct connect to the open listener that is on the open internet for anyone to connect. Then, of course, there'll be a test and control of, auth of authorization to get access to these things if it's like a Microsoft 365. But the interesting thing about this environment and passing it through here is we've allowed those initiators here to get through the controls and still get access to that under the conditional access we, we determine here, whether it be allow, isolate, and so forth. On the other hand, for those applications that you want to keep private, things you don't want to expose to the internet, or you want to keep completely and utterly privately uh, isolated in your VPCs, in your data centers, in your VLANs, then we have a service that we believe is key to driving true zero trust for the other side of the equation, not the initiators, but the destination applications. In that we run a software service here, and we call this a connector. Now, as you can see from the arrow before and the one I'm drawing on top of it, the connector is, an out, is creating an outbound path. What that means is we're not allowing anything to go into those applications. The only way those applications can be spoken to is if all of the context here is valid, the policy allows it, and when that policy allows that, we're actually telling the connector now create an outbound path, like almost taking two ends of a string and then tying them together. It's not one big long string drag from one side to the other, it's two sides coming together in the middle, the middle being this zero trust architecture. This has great implications on businesses when you want to deploy your ecosystems, not just in um, your data centers or your infrastructure as a service environments, but also allows you to steer traffic. So you can make a policy decision here, which we admitted a little earlier intentionally, to be able to steer traffic the way you want. Because everything, if we go back to that fact from earlier, Everything here is not static. It is not a decision that stays in, in, in eternity. We, we make this decision every time there's a new request. So we have the ability to steer traffic the way you want. That actually is one of the most powerful things we can do is determine, based upon all of this, how we want to get that initiator to that destination application under what condition. Steering, not routing, because this is not a routable network. We're not routing these clients down here to this network. We're steering the application request through the entirety of the control, the verify control and policy layer up to the applications where they need to. And so with that, we're able to now determine not only who, but also where they're going, what the controls they need, but also finally the, the policy layer, which coincidentally is also called policy, as well as the element, and allows us to then have that connection end-to-end -end protected and assessed every time there's a request. So now we've done the we've we've, met, we've come to the conclusion of connecting that session for that individual access, and we do it all again every time there's a new request. So this is why an effective zero trust architecture is critical because 
we are not asking anyone to go and build this because it'd be very hard to do this in a set of boxes logically like this. This is a flow process, not necessarily a physical process. This doesn't exist in one location. This exists in multiple places. And the goal is to enable this wherever your users are so they can be anywhere to get access to anything here, anywhere that application is, without ever having to worry about the network layer behind it. It just happens over that network. And that is the goal of a zero trust architecture and an effective zero trust architecture is to provide that great end user experience without the complexity of a, of a network, without the complexity of having to drive everyone back into a network ecosystem where the old legacy controls would be. So I hope that all makes sense. We've covered quite a bit in this deep dive and we will dive into much, much more in other sessions. I really appreciate your time. This has been a Zero Trust Architecture and the effective seven elements to drive that zero trust, zero trust Architecture. My name is Nathan Howe, and I thank you for your time. Bye-bye.